Babylon was a seven-episode miniseries from 2014, co-written by Sam Bain, Jesse Armstrong, and John Brown. The show deals with the inner workings of Scotland Yard, specifically its PR department, as a new American director of communications is brought in by the police commissioner in order to help the police force adapt to the modern media age. While Babylon may seem like a big step away from the previous successful shows co-authored by Jesse Armstrong and Sam Bain, such as Peep Show and Fresh Meat, it very much follows in line with the political satire of The Thick of It, which Jesse Armstrong wrote for. In a sense, these two shows are very similar. Babylon simply widens the scope of its satire and leans further into the dramatic, while retaining the thick of its fast-paced, insult-laden dialogue and documentary-style camera work. In this light, Jesse Armstrong's subsequent solo project, Succession, can be seen as the next logical step after Babylon, emphasizing the drama even further, elevating light political satire to the realm of high tragedy, all the while preserving Babylon and the thick of its visual style and witty dialogue. But Babylon and Succession also share a number of thematic concerns. In fact, many of the shows Jesse Armstrong has been heavily involved in have revolved around the central theme of communication, or more specifically, failed communication. Of course, the thick of it is all about politicians attempting to manage appearances in the face of a constant stream of PR disasters. But even Peep Show, with its POV style and interior monologues, often highlights the disconnect between an individual's true thoughts and their outward behavior, the difference between what they think and what they say. The show's signature awkwardness comes from the main character's profound inability to simply express themselves honestly. You accepted the acceptance. Well, I had to. It was checkmate. There was no way out. Except for telling her how you felt. Oh, right, yeah, sure, like that was gonna happen. Babylon, however, is perhaps the most explicit treatment of this theme in Armstrong's filmography. Of course, the title itself is a reference to the origin of all broken communication, and this breakdown in communication is conveyed in how the show portrays different levels of the British police force, from top management to the PR department to a territorial support group, as well as the average officers on the street and the documentarian covering their work. This fragmentation of the ensemble cast offers different perspectives on specific events and illustrates how information travels from one one sphere of influence to another, and how that information is eventually relayed to the public. This is communicated visually in the show's use of various media through which imagery and information is transmitted. In the first episode, director Danny Boyle places particular emphasis on glass, windows, reflections, and all throughout the series, cameras, televisions, phones appear as important visual and narrative devices. And so, Babylon offers a global view of the many ways in which information is compartmentalized, as well as exposing the incentives and motivations of the various groups who participate in the construction of these media stories. Unlike Babylon, however, Succession doesn't set out to observe the different levels of a particular hierarchy, different slices of a system and its inner workings. Instead, Succession restricts the focus of the narrative to the Roy family, and very rarely offers glimpses into the lives of normal people, which, of course, on one level serves to convey how disconnected from the real, outside world these elites really are which is why the organization of space and the use of locations are so thematically relevant in this series. Any given space or setting in succession inevitably becomes an embodiment or repository of various power dynamics. Yeah, I can't let him dominate the battle space, Lisa. My sister's making moves, I can't just watch it happen. Of course, the series features a number of exotic locales and elite settings in which the division between rich and poor is made explicit, but even within the sphere of the powerful, there exist even more minute divisions. Hey, Shiv. Tom, where are you? I'm with Dad. What? Where? I, I, I'm in the fucking panic room. There's two panic rooms? I think I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong panic room. Spaces are important in this world because access to a particular space means access to particular information, and therefore access to power. Sorry, do I get a vote? Sure you do, buddy. You get to vote at the election with all the other folks. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, I guess I just feel like you maybe get a bigger vote in here. Easy, Castro. Much of Shiv's arc following her integration into the company in season two concerns her attempts to gain access to certain spaces and information flows, which other characters seem intent on excluding her from. 
Of course, different types of locations bring with them different sets of character dynamics and different implications. If you're on a private jet, then you're probably a part of the inner circle. I can't believe I'm on a private plane. It's like I'm in a band. Welcome to the inner sanctum. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nice. Way nicer than the outer sanctum. Whereas a meeting between characters in a random diner in New York may indicate that these characters are maneuvering in secret, far away from the watchful eye of the powerful people up above. It seems that the main reason why Ken's coup in season 1 fails is because he's not in the room at the time of the vote, which enables Logan to dominate the space, intimidating the board members into siding with him. Ken is late to the meeting because he's stuck in traffic, he's down below on the streets, and is thus rendered impotent. And this contrast of high and low, this concept of verticality, is integral to Kendall's character arc, which can be seen as a series of highs and lows. Hey everybody, um, yeah you all know that I've had my ups and downs, you could say. In fact, shots of Ken wandering the streets during his low points are littered throughout the season. The open world of quote-unquote normal people is presented as Ken's personal hell. It's where he ends up when he's banished from places of power. One of the only times we spend a considerable amount of time with normal people in the entire series is when Ken goes on a bender after his failed coup and ends up doing drugs with a group of burnouts. Ken's emotional lows are associated with the low world, away from the elite spaces he's so accustomed to. For Ken, being down below means being in the dumps. And the following episode sees Kendall literally ascending as he goes to meet with Sandy. He's off the streets, so to speak. He's back in the game and is therefore ready to return to a position of power illustrated vertically. Season 2 episode 4 is also built around this vertical axis. The episode opens with Ken, down below, climbing the stairs into the Waystar building, and ends with him on the roof. In this episode, Ken's verticality, his latitude, is an expression of his suicidal ideation following the tragic events of the end of season 1, and his subsequent subordination to Logan. And so, here that verticality expresses the emptiness of his newfound position of power, made insignificant by his moral failings and self-loathing. The height is just another indicator of Ken's felt distance from the real world and everyone around him an expression of his sense of derealization and his inability to connect with other people due to him having this dark secret. This up and down structure to Ken's arc is also reflective of his manic personality and mirrors his wavering periods of drug use and sobriety, as well as, of course, his periods of loyalty to his father and periods of rebellion. Kendall is a character constantly vacillating, always climbing and then inevitably falling. Of course, this tragic, cyclical structure is representative of Jesse Armstrong's extremely cynical approach to character writing. Some people would see growth. I'm on the fence about human beings, and people certainly change what they do, but in my view, people's essential selves don't change. In a way, that's what makes drama and choices interesting. Perhaps the most tragic moment in the entire series so far is in Season 3, Episode 10. After Kendall's confession to his siblings, there is a chance, a possibility of him, or even all three of them, simply walking away from this tragedy, walking away from the system that they have sacrificed their personal and moral lives to. But no, they go right back to it. Shiv and Roman pull Ken all the way back in. In fact, to Shiv and Roman, this low point in Kendall's arc is seemingly just an obstacle to be overcome so they can get back to the really important business, which is confronting Logan about his decision to sell the company. In the following scene, we see how the siblings teaming up to take on their father breathes new life into Kendall, but of course, this is just the beginning of a new cycle, one that can, seemingly for Kendall, only ever end in tragedy. This is the definition of a toxic relationship. It's clear to see that an integral dimension of this tragedy is the inability to separate personal life and professional life, intimacy and business, as we see in the opening episodes of season 1 when Logan first falls ill and his children immediately start strategizing in order to secure their positions in the future of the company. It's also hammered home in season 3 episode 2, when Ken tries to convince his siblings to join his side and take down their father in his own daughter's bedroom, quite explicitly demonstrating how his professional pursuit is taking over his personal life and negatively affecting his ability to be a good father to his children. Uh, 
It's Sophie's room. You remember this kid's name? Uh, uh, Sophie. This correlation between intimacy and business is further explored in Shiv's storyline in season 1, where her affair with Nate is not just a literal extramarital affair, her cheating on Tom, it's also a professional affair, her cheating on the candidate she's working for as she considers jumping over to Gil's campaign. These two narrative threads occur in tandem, and for Shiv's character it's not entirely clear that there's really any difference between these two kinds of cheating these two kinds of seduction. Her intimacy, her private desires, are so inextricably linked to her professional desires. The former is simply an expression of the latter. Of course, Shiv isn't the only character in the series whose sexual life is intertwined with their professional endeavours. Much of Roman's storyline revolves around his abnormal sexual proclivities and the shame associated with them. In fact, the Rocket storyline in Season 1 can be seen as one giant cosmic joke at Roman's expense. His constant striving for his father's approval and respect within the professional sphere of the family business is combined with his sexual impotence, as allegorised in the phallic symbol of the rocket crashing and burning. And then of course there's his relationship with Jerry, another example of this confusion of intimacy and business. The only woman he seems capable of being intimate with is an older woman who's been a part of his family's business for decades. It's a kind of confused edible complex. It's only appropriate then that this storyline would build to a literal confusion, the text message mix-up where Roman's personal and professional lives intersect in the most embarrassing way possible. Of course, it's only natural that the Roy siblings would have such a hard time separating these two dimensions of their lives when they've been in the limelight since they were kids. Due to their father's position in the world, their family life and business life have always been intertwined. It is a family business, after all. And when the business's public image is in peril in season 1, Logan organises a family therapy session in order to reassure shareholders and the public, projecting positivity and openness, projecting an image of a functioning family unit. The irony is self-evident. Therapy, a place where the patient is supposed to be at their most vulnerable, their most honest, their most unguarded, is, with the Roys, transformed into an arena of shielded egos, gathered together with the only real purpose of keeping up appearances. And this idea of family for the sake of business is reiterated throughout the series. Good to see you, thank you. Yeah, it's good to have you back, Dad. A hug would have been nice. Uh, thanks for the donuts. You know, and I think they got enough shots of me through the window, so... No, no, no. Not shots. For the hug. Of course, Logan is just as willing to craft a negative image for his family if it's in his best interest. In episode 8, he threatens Shiv with rumours about her affair if she doesn't come over to his side, and of course he also spread the rumours of Ken's drug use after his failed coup. As always with the Roys, their family drama plays out on the world stage for everyone to see. Everything is a matter of appearances, of the image that is communicated to the outside world. The show's visual style reflects this, its handheld, faux documentary style zooms and spontaneous refocusing simulate a kind of impromptu paparazzi shoot, pointing to the character's sense of self-importance. They really do think they're the centre of the world, and their actions, particularly Kendall's in season 3, are motivated by their belief that they're the main character in a movie. After his big move at the end of season 2, Ken becomes completely self-absorbed and can seemingly no longer distinguish his genuine thoughts and feelings from what he wants other people to think he's thinking and feeling, leading to his breakdown in episode 3, which is the logical, emotional conclusion to his ambivalent relationship with the public. His breakdown backstage at the late night comedy show is that of a person who cannot stand the distant but overwhelming critical murmur of the public, but cannot extricate himself from the public eye. Ken is so desperate to prove that he's cool, that he's down to earth, that he's not like the rest of his family, that he loses himself in a labyrinthine logic of self-aware, ironic image construction. For Ken, self-image and public image are one and the same. The curse he contends with is that he can never be normal, he will always be Kendall Roy. 
The Roy's obsession with image and their devotion to the business at the expense of their personal lives brings to light much more profound questions than simply exposing them as superficial or cupidinous. The series brings into question the Roy family's interiority, the very notion that they may actually have a moral conscience. And this is only highlighted by certain other characters who don't consistently display the same kind of monomaniacal obsession and greed. For example, Rhea's break with Logan at the end of season 2 comes after she realises that Logan's unethical ploys may not simply be a problematic means to an end. He may simply be an immoral man. You knew. You know who I am. I think it's changed. In the details. You don't walk over details. I can't see the bottom of the pool. And I, I don't know if you care about anything. She's one of the few characters who actually backs out instead of compromising her morals even further when presented with an opportunity. Whereas a character like Greg is a perfect example of how a seemingly normal person with no strong convictions or moral principles, when thrown into this world, will quickly become corrupted by power and money. These characters aren't bad people because they don't have feelings, because they don't have morals, because they don't genuinely love their family or friends. They're questionable people precisely because they exist in a world in which they are constantly making moral compromises in the name of business, in the name of money and success and power. These things are constantly at odds with their genuine love for the people and things they care about. The tragedy is that they are too weak or too greedy to walk away from it all and so they will continue to let their flaws eat away at their qualities. The contrast between Tom and Shiv and how they each conceive of their relationship is another example of a dynamic that highlights the Roy's profound insincerity. While Tom certainly appreciates the power he wields in the company, it's clear that he does genuinely love Shiv and spends the first three seasons of the show repeatedly being humiliated and manipulated. This is because Tom is from a much more humble background. He didn't grow up in this system and therefore his conception of love and marriage is much more straightforward, less corrupted by the cynical realism of Shiv's world. That's the prenup. Ooh, okay. Yeah? Yeah, it means it's really happening. We're getting married. And that is a very romantic way of looking at a prenup. You know what? I'm not even gonna look at that. Just show me where to sign. Tom, you have to look at it. No, listen, honestly, honey, I'm not for money, you're for money. I don't want to look at it. Just, I hereby comply. I don't, what? I don't want you to comply. That is not the basis for a healthy relationship. Fine, fine. As a gesture of my love to you, I will have my lawyer look at it, okay? Perhaps one of the most important scenes in the show, not just with respect to Tom and Shiv's storyline, but for the story as a whole, is when Tom asks Shiv... Look, Shiv, uh... Is this real? What do you, what do you mean? Am I, am I a total jerk? The wording of this question is important because it gets at the fundamental character flaw of the Roys. They don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. Does Shiv really love Tom or does she just like the idea of having a husband? Is she just going through the motions of a relationship, doing what you're supposed to do? It's not clear what exactly is real to the Roys. They are almost incapable of communicating honestly with each other and spend most of their time hiding behind different personas. Shiv often appears as the most explicitly dishonest of the four siblings because of her affairs, but also because she has a habit of hiding behind a mask of ignorance or projecting an allegiance to some kind of noble cause when in fact all she really wants is to better her own position. Maybe what differentiates Shiv and Ken's dishonesty is that Ken is more often lying to himself. In Season 1 Episode 5, when Ken tells Frank about his plan to take over the company, he says that he's doing it for his father. And I don't think the truth is even as simple as him just lying. I don't think Ken knows if he genuinely cares about his father's well-being or if this is just pure opportunism. It's easy to lean toward the latter in interpreting Ken's motivations here, and the Roy siblings' motivations in general, but in a way, succession is all about the uninterpretability of these characters' actions along simple lines of good or bad, genuine or corrupt. 
Sure, in most cases they appear to be driven by a hunger for power, but there is also sincere emotion hidden underneath, but it's never expressed directly in the ways they project. They themselves don't really know how to access it or how to understand it. They don't have the proper tools. They've been conditioned to take advantage of any situation for their personal gain. It's like looking through a hall of mirrors in search of the original source of the reflections. And perhaps this is why these characters will never change, because they don't even know what they really want or what they really need. But maybe Ken's statement in that scene actually holds a deeper truth. Maybe, perhaps even subconsciously, he's organising this coup to prove to his father that he does have what it takes, similar to how in the season 2 finale, right after Logan tells him this, You're not a killer. You have to be a killer. Ken is seemingly motivated to prove to his father that he does have the killer instinct. He does have what it takes. So it is true in a sense. He is doing it for his father, but he doesn't even really know it. This might be the true answer to the question, what motivates the Roy siblings? It all goes back to Logan in the end. It's unsurprising that the Roys would be consciously or unconsciously motivated entirely by their father's perception of them when we know from season 1 that their childhood involved a game in which the weakest of the siblings would be locked up in a cage. I think it's significant that, at first, Roman recalls this being Kendall's idea. He was the one who would make Roman go in the cage and even eat dog food, and according to him this is why Logan sent him away to military school. But a later conversation between Connor and Kendall seems to imply that Roman being sent away, and perhaps even the cage game itself, was actually a way for Logan to establish a hierarchy among the siblings. So in Roman's mind, this was a matter of sibling rivalry. But of course, lurking behind the whole thing, we find Logan's tyrannical influence. The Roy siblings have learned to perceive each other as rivals. It's been that way since their childhood, and they even seem to enjoy it to a certain extent. No, we can fight it out. It'll, it'll be fun. That will be fun. <laughs> While Jesse Armstrong may say that he doesn't believe people ever really change, the season 3 finale does appear to show two major character developments. Firstly, Tom's betrayal and apparent decision to finally prioritise his own standing over what he now seems to understand as his failed marriage with Shiv. And then, secondly, of course, Logan's decision to sell the company much to the siblings' dismay. Logan's story is all about his ambivalence towards his own children. Ken might be one of the most deluded characters in the show, but in season 1 he utters what is probably the most accurate description of Logan's tragic flaw. I was born lucky. I'm a lucky person. I realize that. And you're so fucking jealous, aren't you? You're so fucking jealous of what you've given your own kids. You can't handle it. You can't, you, you, you can't work it out. As it stands, it's not clear exactly what motivated Logan to sell the company to Matson. But with everything that's happened between him and Ken, it's perhaps not too far-fetched to see this as a last-ditch attempt by Logan to essentially force his children out of this business and give them a chance to better themselves, extract them from a system that poisons their relationships and breaks down their character through repeated moral compromises. Perhaps I shouldn't be too quick to assume noble intentions on Logan's part though. It wasn't too long ago that he was willing to offer up his own son as a scapegoat in order to protect himself. He even self-mythologized the act as some kind of ritual sacrifice that demonstrated his love for his son, when actually we know for a fact that he's only sacrificing Ken because he's too much of a coward to give himself up. Succession is a very mythical story in its allusions to Greek tragedy, but it's very much about the material reality that underlies a tragedy of mythic proportions. Of course, in mythic terms, selling the company is Logan's self-castration. Sensing a turning of the tide, Logan has somewhat unpredictably accepted the fact that this is it. There's no room for him anymore. He's getting old, and the world keeps on changing, and he can't keep up. And so, if even Logan, who has consistently throughout the series been portrayed as some kind of unstoppable force who always gets what he wants in the end, if even he is too weak to go on, what does that mean for his children? Well, the season 3 finale only serves to further highlight the siblings' utter impotence in the face of these great changes. And that's the underlying question that runs throughout the series. Are the Roys ever really in control? 
Being the main characters of the show, we expect a degree of agency on their part, and they certainly believe themselves to be important. They think they're playing a political game of some sort. But at the end of the day, it seems to be repeatedly proven that the fate of the company is almost always decided by external factors completely out of their control. They are forever subjected to the whims of the public, or the shareholders, or their own father's opinion of them. They don't really have that much power, not in this realm at least. They are unfathomably wealthy, and there's a lot that wealth can do, but this system doesn't really bend to any individual's will. The Roys are slaves to their own appearances, their image, the image of power they want to believe they possess, and can only believe they possess if others believe it too. These characters have become so accustomed to the illusion of their own self-importance that even they begin to forget that there are deeper, greater currents that shape their world, material realities that surpass even them. They are simply surfing a wave, and that wave is about to crash. They have been fooled by their drama, their own little theatrical production. The question that remains for future seasons is whether or not they will leave the world stage peacefully. <laughs>